that. Thank you very much again for coming to listen to me talking about sepsis management in um, resource poor Africa. And I've added to it challenges and opportunities because I think there's lots of opportunities. Um, I'm going to get my glasses, which I've just recently refound again. Um, and just say the area of sub-Saharan Africa, obviously Africa is a huge country with a lot of diversity. And I'm talking about the area that's below North Africa and certainly above South Africa. <laughs> the, the bit in the middle, which is, the, and from a paediatric perspective, um, largely uh, in the places that I work, which are hospitals with limited resources, and just a reminder from what we I said this morning, where there is no access to ventilation. So asking can a critical care approach save lives in Africa? Obviously, there's the one has to work within the realities and the, the context of Africa there's a, and recognize there's a huge demand on the services, but the resources are relatively limited. We've obviously been trying to highlight this as a pr an area for priority, and I've, um, I call this the, uh, the silent emergency, uh, just revisiting some of the, the, the messages I tried to give. That most funders don't think that this is an important area, yet many children will come to a hospital in their final illness, and this could be a very cost-effective way of saving lives if we do the right things. So when I talk about emergency rooms, you probably recognize something like this. Um, you probably have probably more patients than this. This is in Prince Charles Hospital in Australia, but there's lots of equipment there and things that go beep. Um, just going back to the Sorote Hospital, this is a hospital in the nor uh, northeast uh, Uganda, um, and that's the emergency room. You can see that there's no machines that go beep. You can see two nice bottles of oxygen, but I don't think there's any oxygen in them. It's they get filled up intermittently, and um, oxygen is a really big problem of, in terms of supply and, and the burden. And I'm going to talk a little bit like that, uh, about that again. This is the last hour's admissions, so talking about burden, you can see it on the table there. And uh, uh, just again reiterating, the, the uh, child that usually presents that you have to make all your emergency care decisions around is the undifferentiated, critically sick child. So pragmatic uh, uh, guidelines and hopefully cl clinical research that actually try to conduct this in, the, in this context. So while you might not recognize some of the last few slides, you might recognize some of these uh, acute, uh, the, these things that you do give in the emergency room, fluid resuscitation, oxygen, transfusion, correction, in, in, in Africa, the correction of hyperglycemia, um, and also antibiotics. You probably don't recognize this. This was the original report of the artesunate that Nick White found and, this, and brought it into the management. But the, so these are the standard things that we would be thinking about giving in the emergency room. So there's, there's quite a bit of overlap with what you would be thinking about giving a patient. But also, what also overlaps is that while there's a number of guidelines around the world, this is the one that's uh, most widely used in, uh, in, in uh, resource poor settings. Many of the emergency care treatment guidelines have strong recommendations, but the evidence base from quite a lot, of, uh, quite a lot of them, are, are not from clinical trials, and therefore they are weak. They tend to be ev um, uh, expert opinion only. So I'm meant to be talking about sepsis, and I've just that was just a, an introduction. We have lots of sepsis in Africa, but it's probably not the type of sepsis that you recognize. We have lots of complicated, long-named diseases where there's usually only probably one expert I in the world involved in, and this is all nicely written up in Manson's um, Tropical Diseases, but obviously the world became aware of that some of the weird and wonderful diseases that we get in Africa, that roughly um, with the Ebola crisis and how it could potentially threaten. Uh, but. So that's just, you know, there is, um, apart from all the other burden of disease, there is plenty of other things that are simply just not largely covered in guidelines. So how, um, how relevant are the uh, uh, sepsis uh, definitions and the consensus definitions for sepsis? Well, I was just to even start thinking about the feasibility of saying, can we try and define our patients using the, the sort of simple uh, criteria for your SOFA score. Well, certainly, we, we, could, 
we have pulse ox oximeters, they're not widely used, but we certainly couldn't uh, score a patient using these parameters, which is PaO2 um, over FiO2. Well, that's, that's not, we don't have blood gases. Um, coagulation, um, yes, some ch ch children will get point of care hemoglobins, but platelets are less common. So again, we would be ch um, challenged with that. Interesting, you, yes, liver function tests can be done, but they probably cost, if, unless there's, there's a, an external donation, they probably cost more than a viral load. It's actually quite interesting that actually these type of resources are expensive, um, it, just even to do a liver function test. Yes, we can do uh, you're looking at somebody's coma score, and then the same again with renal function. So we'll, we would even be challenged to just basically describe in the same sort of way that you describe sepsis because of the lack of resources. So I'm going to come back to Africa and look at our guidelines. And this is the pediatric guidelines. Um, and there's ve vertical, vertical programs and syndromic management um, considered. Um, these are the large categories, but across the whole guideline, there is not a single mention of the word sepsis or septicemia, which is interesting. Um, the, these are the, obviously, these are the key sort of vertical programs that people are thinking about. And yes, the reason why they've done that is pneumonia fo forms a large uh, proportion of the uh, leading causes of uh, mortality, as does diarrhea and malaria, because this is, this is Africa. So what are the major challenges of sepsis? Well, first of all, is actually getting it, th that word into the guidelines or getting it recognized as a, a, a treatment priority. There is, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about pneumonia syndromes because there's a disproportionate attribution of the under five mortality to the pneumonia syndromes, and I'm calling it syndromes for a reason that you'll see later. 50% um, of pediatric missions will have parasites, but that doesn't mean necessarily their illness is due to that. And in steady stage, African children walk around in health with malaria parasites. So working out what was their actual cause of their, dis their disease. So if you just focus on treating the malaria, you might be missing a large number with sepsis. About 10% of children admitted to hospital with uh, severity and, and malaria actually have bacterial and co-infection. And that accounts for up to a third of the malaria deaths in hospital. So the, the vast majority being gram-negative in infections. And I think the big key to sort of n not making any improvements in sepsis in Africa is the vast majority of hospitals do not have microbiological facilities. So therefore, patients will be started on antibiotics blind and they cannot tailor antibiotics or change them or, uh, and because there's, there is no information that's coming out from the laboratory to help people um, direct, divert the antibiotics to the right patients. So this is a huge challenge. Coming back to the pneumonia definitions, the reason why I'm going to make a, a, a little bit of a discussion, uh, some, uh, something about this is that this is how it used to be defined, very, very clinical signs of this. If you've got these signs, therefore you've got pneumonia. But actually, the, the signs maximize the sensitivity and, and with, a little, with poor specificity. So many of these children actually don't have pneumonia, and I'll show you for a reason why. Furthermore, it was used to be very severe pneumonia where they recommended to give oxygen. In 2013 or 2012, they revised the guidelines and collapsed those two categories together, recommending oxygen for all of those children. And that is an enormous group of children. We, why do, can I say that? Because we've, we know that um, at the centre I work in, Khalifi, every single child that's admitted to hospital has a standard case record. They all have a, a pulse ox oximetry, so we measure um, uh, um, hypoxia, and we also then standardise our clinical diagnosis. And I think, so we... We actually were then able to look back retrospectively and categorize children according to WHO syndromes. And I think the sort of key message is that actually out of the 13,000 children, 36% of children would fulfill definitions of severe pneumonia, yet only 16% actually had a severe pneumonia uh, in the final diagnosis, meaning that we're, we're missing or we're, we're misdiagnosing a lot of children um, using this. 
actually using this to specify who needs oxygen. Many children will receive oxygen um, if you don't have a pulse oximeter, and that is reality in Africa, meaning that the resource is being used up and it's being given to the wrong children. But it's also, there's a huge hidden burden of hypoxia that, doesn't, that don't fulfill those guidelines, meaning that those children are probably being denied oxygen in the absence of using pulse oximetry. So oxygen is expensive and it's in poor supply and it's not, uh, uh, um, uh, it, 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 it's in poor supply because A, if you've not got your bottles, you, the WHO prefers oxygen concentrators, which are great, but they're usually not enough for a, a single paediatric ward and what happens when the power goes off. So th these are huge challenges for um, pneumonia. In terms of etiology of pneumonia, there's been a, a multi-center study called PERCH that occurred across many centers in Africa, but also included Asia. And they were specifically looking at the bacterial and viral etiology of uh, pneumonia. And they concluded that this is the, on the last one here, this is the PERCH study, that of all of those children with severe and very severe pneumonia, only between 9 and 16% actually had a path pathogenic etiology, meaning that probably 85% had another cause of admission. So again, that huge burden of disease is, uh, is, is very challenging. So it, they probably represent the critically ill child. And so if thinking that we're going to be able to reduce this burden on services by giving better vaccines, etc., it's, it's not going to go away because there's a high burden of critically sick children. And certainly we can't give all of those children with uh, 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 the pneumonia syndromes uh, oxygen because it's simply not available. So this is one of the reasons why we designed the um, a current trial, which we started in February. It's another controlled trial of oxygen because reality is that most children don't receive oxygen. We're comparing um, oxygen just given as, as usual, but also Fisher and Paykel have given us a very, very generous donation of their high flow machines or airvo machines. With, we hypothesized if you're going to receive oxygen, then why don't you receive it with some respiratory support? This provides a bit of PEEP and hopefully averts children from dying from expiratory exhaustion. So that's 4,200. We've got 700 in the trial so far and hopefully sometime I might be able to come back and tell you about the results. Um, it's been quite challenging to set up, but uh, we think it's a very important trial. Let, let's go back to bacteria etiology. I've already talked about this center called Khalifi, where we not only did all of those other things, but each, every single child had a blood culture when they were admitted to hospital, irrespective of uh, diagnosis. And so uh, we were able to provide a very, very comprehensive picture for the first time of what the spectrum of bacteria were. Now, this, this study was, con this was conducted outside the meningitis belt, so you won't see any uh, meningitis there. Since the publication, um, there has been inf um, in, in introduction of haemophilus and also polyvalent uh, strep pneumonia. So although we see that pneumo strep pneumonia is the commonest uh, cause of bacterial infection, um, that's obviously going to come down the ranks and certainly haemophilus is, is almost uh, melted away, meaning that the vast majority are gram-negative organisms that we're seeing. Antibiotic guidelines have been were defined many years ago, maybe two decades ago. They haven't actually been updated, with the river, you know, in, um, despite the publication of the, these type of data suggesting that s many of the children with the, the syndromes might not uh, respond to their current first line antibiotics. I did mention a little bit about sepsis and severe malaria, uh, just to, s to say how how very different this is. Um, as I said, most children will carry parasites, and so they're not all, always necessarily... Uh, um, uh, they're, they're, if they've got a positive slide, that's not necessarily their, their single diagnosis. So this just shows you the spectrum of uh, organisms in a child that comes in that's slide negative, um, and you see that's non-typhoidal salmonella, strep pneumonia, uh, haemophilus, and uh, with gram negatives at the top. But as the minute that you, the child has uh, either recently cleared their malaria parasitemia or has got malaria, you see the number of gram negatives that you're, you're seeing. So they, the, the commonest organism for co-infection in malaria is, is non-typhoidal salmonella. 
the, the AMP and GENT or the, the, uh, is, it simply d won't treat that. It would need at least a week's course of keftriaxone or alternative strategy. So again, this uh, get challenges the sort of uh, how, how we should be standardly att approaching these children. We're not the only ones to highlight this as a concern. Um, this was a, a comprehensive systematic review of all uh, uh, all studies looking at invasive uh, uh, bacteremia and uh, again uh, confirming that it's non-typhoidal salmonella. It doesn't matter where you, whether you live in East Africa, it's the same in North Africa. That includes more other typhoids, but East, West and South Africa. So again, these are one of the commonest organisms. My final slide is, this is not an area of expertise, but obviously from the the things that I've talked about, a lot, a lot of gram-negative infection um, uh, um, and also the current antibiotics and, and being used without doctors even knowing what the culture result is, means that antibiotic stewardship is a really huge problem. So even less is known about resistance patterns across Africa. So we were able to look at the resistance patterns in our in our studies, but um, even for the many of the other hospitals, if they did have culture um, facilities, they don't really have any sophistication on looking for resistance. So this is projected to be a substantial problem for Africa going forward. Simple treatment based. I just wanted to. Uh, this is. I uh, wanted to ha end on a happy note rather than a sad note. And so I've done uh, some ticks of the things that we have tested in clinical trials or are about to test in clinical trials. Um, I was very fortunate to be involved in the uh, Aquamat trial, which has compared uh, artesunate, um, injectable artesunate, to quinine. The time-honoured quinine. Quinine was still working. It wasn't, although it wasn't working. And, and then I, um, this is, I also obviously ran the FEAST trial. And when people say, well, does one to two to five percent absolute difference may make a difference, which is what was shown with the Aquamat trial, that uh, artesunate was that degree better than quinine. Well, this is what they've calculated, that actually by implementing artesunate rather than quinine, they could avert the lives of 100,000 children a year. So we'd also calculated by the three to four percent difference in by not giving boluses, how many th th tens of thousands of lives one can save by doing research and hopefully informing guidelines. Thank you. Is that me?